Well, the House of Commons has elected Sir Lindsay Hoyle as its new Speaker, succeeding John Burko. A few days before the official election campaign gets underway on Wednesday, Sir Lindsay, originally a Labour MP, was formerly Deputy Speaker and he secured a significant majority in the final round of voting in the Commons just a couple of hours ago. Uh, the Speaker's role, of course, has been crucial in recent years as Parliament has struggled to deal with the Brexit crisis, as our Chief Political Correspondent Vicky Young tells us. We're going to be hearing a lot more of this man's voice in the coming months as he oversees the next chapter in these tumultuous political times. According to parliamentary tradition, Sir Lindsay Hoyle had to be dragged to the Speaker's chair, where he made this promise. I will be neutral. I will be transparent. I think this House, we can do more to ensure that that transparency continues. His family were watching from the public gallery and he spoke of their heartache over the death of his 28-year-old daughter. My daughter Natalie, I wish you'd have been here. We all miss her as a family, no more so than her mum Marie. I've got to say, she was everything to all of us. She will always be missed, but she will always be in our thoughts. Yeah. Lindsay Hoyle was elected the Labour MP for Chorley in 1997, and he's been Deputy Speaker for nine years. He's steeped in politics. His dad was also an MP. Go on. His pets are named after famous politicians, a dog called Gordon, a tortoise named Maggie, a parrot named Boris. I'm no good at call. <laughs> the first time, the Prime Minister. <laughs> the kindliness of the Speaker is absolutely critical to our confidence and the way we behave. And Mr Speaker, over the years I have observed that you have many good qualities. People are put under enormous stress both staff and members of this House. I know you take your responsibilities in that area very, very seriously. The Speaker's appearance might have changed over the years, but their role keeping order in the Commons is as crucial as ever. They can influence what gets debated, but some thought John Burko went too far, bending the rules to side with anti-Brexit MPs. Sir Lindsay Hoyle supporters say he'll adopt a down-to-earth, calm approach when he swaps his Lancastrian home for the grand Speaker's residence in the Palace of Westminster. <laughs> this Speaker is unlikely to be as controversial as the last. Vicky Young, BBC News. Doctors and health service leaders in England have warned party leaders against using the NHS as a political weapon during the general election campaign. NHS providers, which represents hospitals and other health trusts, says that spending promises made in the heat of the election battle risk creating unrealistic expectations among voters, as our health editor Hugh Pym tells us. Uh, nice big bus, you can come round. It's a familiar story at elections down the decades. I've had sufficient physiotherapy in my time to know Political party leaders visiting hospitals. It is possible for men to get it's yeah. interpreted by reading the, the, the digits or, or do you do it? It's the same once again. Boris Johnson is in a hospital almost daily, while Labour today also focused on the health service. But there's a warning the debate has now got out of hand. We would ask our politicians to exercise a bit of self-control and to make sure that the, ev the debate we're going to have is evidence-based, it's mature, and it's not just political punch and duty. Health leaders say it's all the more important to have a considered debate about the future of the NHS because it's under immense strain right now. They say they're worried about the level of pressure even before winter has really set in. So how does this hospital chief executive see things? We've been very busy over the summer here at Milton Keynes. It's really important that we have the right staff available to us. We're going to see some real peaks in demand. Staffing is a problem. There are 107,000 vacancies across the NHS in England, and all this as demands rising, with nearly 4% more emergency hospital admissions over a year. What about GP practices? One doctor gave her perspective. All winters are the same or similar. Uh, as GPs, we expect to be working a little bit harder, uh, longer hours, seeing a few more patients. The latest figures show there were 4.4 million people waiting for routine surgery in England, a record high, and nearly 65,000 in September had to wait more than four hours for a bed after being admitted through A&E. We asked patients and visitors outside a London hospital this evening about their experiences. 
This student has been waiting in A&E with her friend. What sort of uh, atmosphere is there in there? Uh, people seem to be in quite a lot of pain. Um, uh, people keep going up to the desk asking when they'll be seen next, so people feel quite impatient. This woman says she and her children have been well cared for. Basically on the whole we were seen and um, I think it's a fantastic service. I'm very grateful for the NHS. The Westminster election NHS debate is mainly about England. The devolved administrations run their own health systems, though there's no doubting the passion for the NHS right across the UK. Hugh Pym, BBC News. In some of the day's other election news, Nigel Farage has unveiled the Brexit Party's 600 election candidates, though he isn't one of them, saying that he believes the party is more of a danger to Jeremy Corbyn than to Boris Johnson, because he says five million Labour supporters voted to leave the EU in the 2016 referendum. The Lib Dems are taking legal advice over ITV's decision to exclude them from its forthcoming TV debate between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the leader, Jo Swinson, claims that hers is the true party of Remain and that she is the only female leader with a shot at becoming Prime Minister. The leader of Plaid Cymru, Adam Price, launched the party's general election campaign in Anismorn, Anglesey. He uh, accused both Labour and the Conservatives of having failed Wales and said the country's future should be as an independent nation. Now, the Commons Intelligence and Security Committee report into possible Russian interference in UK elections will not be published before the general election. The committee chair, the former Conservative, now independent MP, Dominic Grieve, said that Number 10 was being disingenuous and misleading by claiming that there wasn't enough time to publish the report. Uh, it has received security clearance and the BBC understands there is no administrative reason for it not to be made public. Now, the leader of the Scottish National Party, Nicola Sturgeon, has accused Boris Johnson of treating Scottish voters with contempt after he ruled out allowing a second referendum on independence. The SNP have made another referendum a key feature of their election campaign. Of the 13 Conservative seats in Scotland right now, over half are considered to be marginal, and that means that a swing of some 5% or less could see a change, as our Scotland editor Sarah Smith explains now. In Stirling, the fight is as tight as it gets. The Tories won by less than 150 votes when they took this seat from the SNP in the last election. No wonder voters are fortifying themselves, ready for a campaign in which the divisive question of independence is likely to dominate. I think it's going to be independence related. Um, so if all of Scotland is covered with SNP members of parliament, then that clearly shows something important. I think independence will be a big issue, but there are other aspects to look at as well. That you think we should be looking at? I think we should be, yes. The Yes movement, gathered en masse in Glasgow's George Square this weekend, believe this election could be the next step toward an independent Scotland, especially now the SNP have put it at the very heart of their campaign. For everyone here who's impatient to see an independent Scotland, they know this general election could be crucial. A good result for the SNP will make it that bit harder for Westminster to refuse to allow another independence referendum. So do you see this election essentially as a referendum on whether or not Scotland should be allowed to have an independence referendum? That is certainly you know, the big issue at the heart of this election in Scotland. Uh, do we want our future determined for us by the likes of Boris Johnson or do we want to take our future into our own hands and determine the path we take and the kind of country we want to be? The Tories are looking to spread the same message. Independence is a much easier topic for them than Brexit in a marginal seat like Ochil and South Perthshire. They love it every time Nicola Sturgeon talks about another referendum. What do you think? I think, yippee! Because, I mean, every time you, Nicola goes on the television and bangs on about independence, we get more votes. Are you sure? Absolutely. So when Nicola Sturgeon says she's making this campaign about independence, do you think that's good for Tories? Fantastic news. Really? Yes. The Conservatives want to position themselves as the only reliable defenders of the Union even though the Lib Dems promise that they too will protect the UK. Voters may be confused by Labour's position, who say they don't want another referendum, but would not block one. And the SNP are hoping that by making their demand for another referendum so central,
that will make it difficult for the next Prime Minister to say no. Sarah Smith, BBC News. Well, all political parties have stepped up their campaigns on social media in recent days. Political advertising on platforms such as Facebook has been the source of great controversy in the past few years, with concerns about personal data falling into the wrong hands. But as our media editor Amal Rajan reports, uh, that hasn't stopped campaigners looking to digital channels as a powerful tool to reach more voters. Election campaigns are ultimately a branch of the marketing industry. In the 21st century, that means they've shifted online. This weekend saw a significant escalation of political ads in our Facebook and other social media feeds, but tactics varied across the parties. Conservatives focused on Brexit and targeted marginal constituencies such as Cone Valley with the message that just a few hundred votes could be decisive. Labour looked to policy beyond Brexit with an NHS ad that linked to a Guardian article. The Lib Dems tweaked their attack ad against Jeremy Corbyn for different audiences. One claimed he was a Brexiteer at heart, another questioned his leadership credentials. But how exactly do digital marketers, political and otherwise, target us? The industry is seeing exponential growth. This British firm doesn't work for political parties, but helps brands reach their target audience. Every single action that people take online almost is tracked as a data point that we can use to inform our targeting and that's whether they've um, taken a certain amount of time dwelling on a page, whether they've expressed interest in something, liked something, joined a group, almost purchased something but not purchased something, purchased something. Um, every single one of these is a signal. All right, so how narrowly can you focus your target? You'll be blown away by how specific we can be in terms of targeting individual people. We could, for example, within Newcastle under Lyme, choose a nurse who's recently qualified within a certain income bracket, who's interested in fitness and wellness, uh, and then under behaviours, uh, has recently returned from travel within the last one or two weeks. That's how specific we can get. What then is the appeal of social media to political campaigners? First, it's very quick. It's also a cheap medium. You can pay sometimes as little as £100 to reach thousands of swing voters. The other reason, of course, is that you're allowed to advertise on social. Political, British political parties are not allowed to advertise on TV or on radio, unlike the counterparts in America. This is the age of data. All around us is an infinite swirl of personal information which you and I add to every time we browse, swipe, like or click. And far from the Madden crowd, political marketers, mavericks and miscreants are plundering those innocent digital ticks to capture our attention and persuade us to give them a hearing and a vote. Recent plebiscites show campaigners tend to save most of their digital budgets for the climax of a campaign. The best and the worst is yet to come. Amal Rajan, BBC News. Just a reminder, for more coverage of the election, you can go online, where there's a simple but extensive guide to the election and the issues of the state of the parties uh, going into that vote on December the 12th. That's at bbc.co.uk. Um, and then, of course, you have the BBC News app as well.